Hello and welcome to the Scientists in Science Fiction panel. I'm Riley, I'm the moderator, and I'm with, um, um, sorry, and I'm uh, with uh, Ivan Bilonas, Holly Ash, uh, Patricia Tavomina, and MK Martins. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. So, so first of all, I will give uh, each panelist uh, our, uh, a moment to present uh, themselves, starting with uh, Holly. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Holly Ash. I am a science fiction author. I have five books currently published, four in an underwater military series called The Journey Missions, and then a sci-fi suspense novel called Cleansing Rain um, that deals with eco-terrorism. When I am not writing, I work as an environmental engineer in automotive manufacturing. Um, my specialty is regulatory compliance for water and waste management. Thank you. Uh, Patricia? Hi, I, uh, I'm Patricia Tavermina. I have been, in, I'm a retired scientist. I've worked in a bunch of different fields from the Human Genome Project to life in the deep ocean and other stuff too. I've also done a lot of teaching in my life, but now, I, now I'm retired, I'm at home, uh, writing climate fiction. So I've got a couple novels out. I'm writing them in a series. The first one is uh, sitting over my shoulder here. And that uh, is uh, set on another planet. And this young woman can see greenhouse gases. And this causes all sorts of problems for her in her life. And the second, the second title is out now, which is very exciting. And I'm working on the third. I'm really happy to be here. This is my second year with Right Hive. Uh, and I look forward to talking about using science and science fiction today. It's a great panel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ivan? Hi, everyone. My name is Ivan. Um, my debut novel, The Hearse, is coming out in July 2022 uh, by Inspired Quill in the UK. Um, I have uh, short science fiction stories published in Clark's World and on spec, um, Canadian science fiction journal. Um, my day in my day job, I work for a wind turbine manufacturer, um, fighting the good fight, trying to save what's left of this planet. And um, I have worked previously with uh, loggerhead turtle rehabilitation and uh, small research programs for um, for climate change. Okay. I'm very uh, much looking forward to this panel. Uh, thank you, MK. Um, hi, so uh, my name is MK Martins. Uh, during the daytime, I'm a, a scientist in the field of molecular biology. So I currently work in a field of uh, glycobiology and aging research. Um, but I've also worked in, uh, you know, molecular, uh, more, mo more molecular fields and uh, microscopy and um, cell biology and a little bit uh, more of the immunology. So um, my background is uh, mostly biology. I also uh, am a writer by night whenever I manage, <laughs> though in the last two years um, I'm also a mom, so that kind of cuts down my writing time. Um, but uh, I do write uh, still a lot of the short stories uh, and especially microfiction, which I also publish on my Instagram. And uh, I, am, I have a short story collection, which uh, I'm um, preparing and editing and uh, that I'm planning to self-publish uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so let's start with the question. Uh, first of all, uh, how do you use your background in science since you are, uh, have uh, Maria of SBC, how do you uh, use it to influence uh, your stories, uh, starting with Ivan? Back in university, um, I worked with a couple of professors who uh, consulted the United Nations um, towards putting together the Kyoto Protocol. And even back then, it was there were clear signs and trends of climate change and what that would entail for humanity in general. Um, everything I write has a very heavy climate change slant, climate fiction slant. And 
I sometimes joke, it's not a particularly good joke, but sometimes joke that I'm not really writing science fiction, but I'm writing uh, delayed historical fiction in the sense that nothing I put in my stories really is that far off what's going to happen. So we're looking into projections of um, famine, we're looking into projections of uh, droughts, we're looking into projections of uh, mass migrations because of uh, climate change. Those things do make it into my stories, they do make it into my books. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the more of a warning, they're not so much fiction. Um, this, those things are always, are always playing on the back of my head and I'm trying to, I'm trying to push them through my stories um, because it is one thing that worries me. It is one thing that, as cliche as it sounds, keeps me up at night. Um, and I do wish that more people would take it a little bit more seriously and they would see the danger and they would see the signs. Um, so this is, this is how my background tends to influence what I'm writing. It's always an ongoing anxiety that I have that I just need to exercise in some capacity. Patricia? Yeah, so my background uh, also informs my writing heavily. Uh, I, I would focus on my teaching as, as influencing my writing because in when you know when you stand in front of a classroom full of students, you sometimes it helps to be able to explain a very simple concept in a half a dozen ways. Uh, not everybody hears the same problem in the same way and being able to think about, you know, whatever it is, some cellular process like glycolysis, being able to understand that in a, a bunch of different ways to describe it can help people kind of comprehend it. And so I feel like that sort of uh, practice of thinking about problems in multiple ways works into my fiction because whether it's something simple like, you know, how can I change this narrative structure so that it's more effective or, uh, how can I avoid repeating myself and yet still make the same point? You know, that kind of um, uh, flexibility, for lack of a better word, uh, ends up informing my writing. So the teaching, definitely. And then in terms of the science itself, uh, my last research uh, gig was uh, in the deep ocean where these incredible animals live and they live in these really weird and foreign alien ways to the way we think about life on the surface of the planet because there's no light, there's no photosynthesis. Uh, so, you know, so these creatures are, are, you know, they're breathing sulfur instead of oxygen. And you have six foot long tube worms, you know, that are living in clusters together. Uh, all of it's driven by chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis and symbiosis rules the day, which is fantastic. So those, uh, those creatures and that way of way of thinking about how a photon of light can become a means of communication, you know, those things help me think about new worlds and the sorts of bizarre ways we can play in those worlds. Okay, and uh, Holly? Um, similar to everybody else, of course, my work is influencing my writing, um, similar to Evan, I look at what's happening in the environment and what I'm working to prevent happening with my manufacturing plants um, and kind of escalate that and project worlds that look like what would happen if everything went wrong. Um, so a lot of that works its way into the story. A lot of it I find is subconscious. I don't realize I'm doing it until I go back and read it later and I have those themes in there. But I do sometimes pull a lot more intentionally from my work. Uh, since I do work in what is a manufacturing environment, I get to pull things like safety into it. Um, in one of my books, I have some safety accidents and what can go wrong there. Um, I do a lot of emergency response. I'm the person that gets called at three o'clock in the morning when they find something leaking outside and I have to go and problem solve on the spot and clean up. Um, figure out how to clean it up and how to prevent it from entering the environment. So I use a lot of those type of skills and those incident command skills when I'm writing a lot of things. Um, and then sometimes I take very directly from my work. Uh, the last book I just published, it was the fourth book in the Journey Mission series. And um, a large part of my day job is being audited and inspected and having regulators come in and make sure I'm following the rules and I know what I'm talking about. And it's stressful to have someone question everything you think you know, and you second guess yourself, and you're constantly doubting yourself, and am I doing this right? So I put an inspection as one of the plot lines in my story so I could kind of use some of those emotions 
to get the reader to feel that tension and how important some of these themes are as far as, you know, following environmental regulations and a little bit of how much is political versus how much is science and kind of play with that in there too, because I deal a lot with that, the science versus the politics in my job. Um, I think that's uh, that's an interesting question. That's, um, well, first, the actually the first story that I ever wrote uh, had um, nothing and really nothing to do with the biology, even though already back then I actually wrote it in um, school while I was still at school and already then I was super interested in biology um, but already then I was fascinated with something so the first novel that I wrote was uh, placed in, in ancient Egypt and uh, you know already then I was fascinated with all of these like animals and little birds living there so I would go like in the middle of the chapter, I would go into like, oh my God, you know, this character found this very cool bird and then there is this nest and then, you know, that's how the bird is uh, like feeding themselves and so on and so on. So it was uh, basically already, you know, from the start when I started writing, I was so into biology that it kind of crept in into my writing. So then as, as I started working, you know, uh, in science, uh, it kind of naturally um, introduced itself into everything that I wrote. And it, it, it was on multiple levels, you know, like first level is just the environment in which I was moving, which was, you know, very international environment, uh, like a very diverse environment. And then, you know, somehow my stories were also, um, aside from the fact that they were placed in the future, they were always placed in this, you know, like multinational environment uh, full of the different people and different nationalities interacting together. And then the second level at which it uh, influenced it is the science itself. So um, as I became more and more acquainted with science, I really, really enjoyed more and more putting, uh, you know, kind of like these hard science facts into my stories, but making it approachable uh, for a broader audience. So uh, even though like in a shorter story is that is some, sometimes, you know, not as obvious because you don't have so much space and you don't have so many words to explain it. You know, in everything that I write that is a little bit longer, I, I'm kind of always diffusing uh, science within it and uh, trying to make it as natural as possible and as you know approachable as possible to a general audience. So we started uh, 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 heard uh, the term hard sci-fi and soft uh, sci-fi. What, uh, what are they? And do you have any preference, uh, pa uh, pa pa Patricia? Well, I, I'm so glad this question's on the panel because I hope to figure it out. I've been trying to figure out the distinction between hard science fiction and soft science fiction for a long time, and I have no idea what the difference is. Um, I, I sort of feel like uh, if, if there's spaceships and guns, then it must be hard sci-fi, but I don't really know. So I'm going to pass on this one if that's okay and let other people explain it to me. Yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Yes. Uh, Holly? Sure. So the difference between, typically what I've seen as the difference between hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi is the amount of detail and actual science that goes into the story. So the hard sci-fi is going to be something like The Martian or Jurassic Park or something like that, where they really get down into the details on how the science works and what they're doing. And they're going to explain to you the genetic process behind how they made the dinosaurs or how to grow potatoes on Mars, or how does that super engine on the spaceship work? That to me is gonna be the hard sci-fi. You're gonna get into the weeds of the science. Soft sci-fi to me typically kind of brushes over it. It's gonna say, we have a space portal, but it's not necessarily gonna say, how does it work? Um, we're gonna have that future tech in that, um, you know, kind of extrapolating on the technology we have now and where can we go, but we're not going to quite explain how we get there. 
Um, that's always been the definition I've worked with between hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi. Um, for me personally, I write soft sci-fi. I don't tend to get into the weeds of the science. I like to let the science and the tech support the character and the stories rather than the story be about the science. So for me, that's my personal preference. Um, I read both, but I tend to write soft sci-fi. My goal is to make sci-fi more accessible and less intimidating to readers. And I think sometimes when they think sci-fi, they're like, I'm gonna have to know physics in order to understand the story. So I try to gloss over it and just leave little hints at what the science is there and kind of how it connects back to the technology that we have today. Okay, um, Ivan? I'm with Holly on this, um, especially the definition of hard versus soft sci-fi. Um, as far as I'm concerned, hard sci-fi goes into the details of what could plausibly work as actual science. Um, and there, there's, I'm probably going to ruffle a lot of feathers. There's a lot of people out there who really like the kind of stuff. They really like going through the details, getting an understanding of what the science is behind your spaceships, your portals, your quantum entanglements, what have you. Um, but that's not my cup of tea. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I much more prefer soft science fiction because I view science fiction as literature and the technology being more of a literary device as opposed to being something that acts as, as, as an attraction to, uh, for the story. Um, I view the science in science fiction as an excuse in order to explore certain themes as opposed to uh, being the um, both the end and the means at the same time. So for my money, I read soft science fiction. I prefer writing soft science fiction. Um, do I enjoy hard science fiction? Maybe, sometimes. I mean, The Martian is a pretty good example, but I mean, The Martian is a pretty good story, period. Um, there was a book some time ago, um, that was published some, kind of, some time ago called Seven Eves that was hard science fiction, but beyond these two books, I don't think that I've ever really gotten into, into that niche. Um, no disrespect to anybody who likes it. You, you like what you like, I like what I like as well. Um, for my mind, I'm probably going to stick to soft science fiction. Okay, so between hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi, I would say I usually prefer hard sci-fi if it's written, you know, in a very easy and approachable way. So uh, one, a couple of examples that I have is, for instance, like Andy Weir, and uh, I've just recently read his Hail Mary and there, you know, there's a mix, there is really hard science in there, like also in the more popular Martian, but there is also, you know, enough imagination and enough of the explaining in there to, and, you know, also other stuff that make it more interesting that it's not overbearing uh, um, for someone, I think even someone coming outside of the field. And then, um, well, I think if hard science is a little bit too harsh and, and not explained in a good way, then I would prefer maybe a soft sci-fi. But in my writing, I do try to stick more to the hard facts. I, I actually prefer writing you know by the rules uh, of our physics and biology and chemistry I think it makes it a little bit more fun you know if you can imagine anything and you know you can play with the rules and with the physics and with the chemistry then you know you can create all kinds of these fun worlds but there are no boundaries by which which force you kind of to make something creative within this universe. And that's what I really love, uh, you know, when I'm, for instance, imagining exoplanets, I look at the planet, I look at the gravity of the planet, I look at the spectrum of the sun, and I uh, I look at the, you know, temperatures range, what kind of, 
like climate could this planet have then I start imagining life what kind of life could live in that climate you know how would it evolve uh, uh, you know what kind of uh, interactions would there be between different species on this planet and it's fun to do this you know just sticking by the rules of our physics and chemistry and trying to imagine new creative ways how you know life could evolve under a little bit different conditions than on earth what are some basic scientific principles any sci-fi writer should apply in their stories? I don't know if there's necessarily a catch-all of you have to know chemistry or physics or biology in order to write sci-fi. I think people without science fiction back or without science backgrounds can absolutely write science fiction. I think what you want to do um, if you're not in that field that you want to address and explore in your story is get a basic understanding of some high level principles, whether you're talking space travel, um, you're talking climate change or some of these climate fictions. Um, if you're looking at certain biological effects or genetics, get a basic understanding and then write your story. You, my, what I do and what I, I think the story has to come first. So know some basics so you can make it plausible. You can always go back and research and add in details later when you're doing your editing. So as long as you know some high level concepts and some of the high level rules of the science, whether it's physics based, um, environmental based, biological based, I think you're good to start telling your story and you can always fill in those gaps when you go back to do your edits. I don't think there's any scientific principles that should be should always be applied into stories. I, I would actually go as far as to say that the only principle that should be applied is consistency and a certain amount of internal logic. You want to break basic physics rules, go ahead and do it. But you know, as long as you do it in a consistent manner and as long as it serves the story, I, I really don't see any issues with, 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 with that. Um, I used to be, I used to be more of the, within the school of thought that said that at least you need to apply certain, you needed to follow certain basic principles, right? So no fast and the light travel because that's not gonna happen. Um, um, liquids can, um, water cannot be compressed. That's not gonna happen. But in the end of the day, you know, you just start asking us, yourself, why not? I mean, why not break those rules if it means that I get a good story? Um, I'm probably butchering the quote Somebody once said, um, don't let reality get in the way of a good story. And I guess you can paraphrase this and say, don't let science get in the, in the way of a good story. Um, I'm feeling a lot of people would disagree with me on that, but at the end of the day, we're not talking about the scientific manual, right? We are talking about a story. We are talking about escapism and we're talking about getting an understanding of, of the human condition. We're not talking about a manual. We're not talking about the textbook. So as long as you're consistent, as long as your science has a, an internal logic and as long as you stick to it, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Uh, pa uh, Patricia? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I think those are both great perspectives. I, um, I feel like some stories succeed so brilliantly because they do, like The Martian has been mentioned twice already, and it's on my list of great science fiction as well, because it does try to point at real science. Like some, some science fiction does that, and that's its strength. And then uh, other science fiction is more socially leaning. It's dealing with social issues. Um, I think this is why I have difficulty with the hard science versus soft science uh, distinction is because biology was called a soft science when I was in college and uh, physics, that was a hard science. And so I, I always felt like that biology is full of hard science too. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, some of these lines between you know what is science you know social science is a science so if we're writing science fiction with a social science approach it's it's still got scientific principles like you know use science for inspiration don't use science as a limitation if you can find some new science that inspires you about dark matter 
about, you know, brain chemistry, about whatever, and you find it exciting, lean into that. That's the principle, I would say. Uh, <laughs> that is, um, I think that is a little bit tricky and a little bit, yeah, it's a hard question because I think today, um, sci-fi is basically, you know, such a flexible term that in reality that you you don't actually need to or are forced to apply almost anything you know there are mixes between sci-fi and fantasy there are mixes between you know like historical fiction and sci-fi there are you know rules are bending uh for sci-fi um but it, i would say that you know if you're trying to kind of write a uh, hard sci-fi or a little bit more scientific sci-fi that some of the basic rules and principles that you should stick to are you know basically like i mentioned uh, the the rules of uh, physics and chemistry you know that apply to this uh universe and you know you should always try to do a thorough study of those and um of course you're not going to be an expert in everything but for instance when i try to write uh, some sort of um like a story which is um more um let's say based on a on a moon in our solar system or something like that then i try to consult you know experts uh, who are um, not in the field of biology, but also physics and engineering and, uh, you know, space engineering, especially. Um, so you should try to, if you're writing hard sci-fi, you should try to um, stick to the rules of this universe that we know. You should try to uh, consult the experts whenever you don't know the answers. Um, and you should do a thorough you know, research. And um, even when you have, you know, consulted experts and data research and everything, you should also try to, you know, repeat this process and uh, test it on, a, on an audience and see if there is anything uh, that you've missed um, in between. But as I said, you know, the, the sci-fi today is such a very, very, very broad term that I I'm not, I don't think that there is anything as a writer, as a creative writer that you absolutely must and have to stick to. It's, uh, it became so much more flexible. How do you handle things that need a heavy exposition in your story while still uh, making things understandable for your reader? Uh, Patricia? Sure. Um, so when I think about writing a story, I, I tend to break it down into three areas, the narrative, the dialogue and the action. Uh, and I think that a lot of early manuscripts might rely too heavily on one or another of those, and you just need to balance them out. So um, a story, for example, could describe through narrative how radiation destroys organic matter. It could all be an info dump and people are going to skim right over that. Or you could see Spock fixing the warp core or whatever it was and his flesh melting off of him and Kirk is crying through the shielding and McCoy is saying in dialogue, he's already dead, Jim. And now you're pulling in action, narrative and dialogue into a single moment and, and it's shown, it's shown effectively. And I think that's the way to convey something is by placing it in an action with dialogue. I would agree with Patricia a hundred percent. I don't, because I write softer sci-fi, I don't have a ton of exposition and a lot of explanation because I try to skim over how the things work anyway, but sometimes you can't get around it. So I do like to use my characters to, whether they're explaining it to one another, they're working on an equipment and something's going wrong and they have to fix it and they're yelling out orders or things like that. Um, so I like to try and keep it organic with the story. I don't try to put too much detail in there. 
if you wanted to learn how, you know, about microplastics in the ocean, you're not going to read my ecoterrorism novel. That's not what you're there for. Is it covered? A little bit. It's one of the things that they're working on. Um, but if you want to read that, go read, if you want to learn about that, go read the scientific papers. So I like to put in just enough to make it feel real and believable um, and do that through action and character dialogue, whether that's, you know, teaching or explaining something or working through a problem and problem solving for my characters. Well, when you get to that point where you need to start explaining and explaining and explaining about how something works, it might be a good idea to take a step back and um, ask yourself whether or not your project thinks the right way. Um, if you're over explaining something, who was it that said it? If, if you over explain something, you probably don't understand it yourself. I think that was Einstein who said it. So, you know, always ask yourself, do we, what, what exactly are we trying to do? Are we trying to explain the technology or are we trying to, to tell a story? Um, because most technology is created in order to achieve a goal, right? I mean, um, probably most people don't know how an internal combustion engine works, but they know that it gets them from point A to point B. And that's the important part. The, the impact is the important part, not how exact, how the mechanics work. So, you know, taking the Star Trek example, um, does anybody really know how teleportation works? Is it ever really explained on the show? I, I'm honestly not sure, but we know that you step on the teleportation boat and you are transported a very, very large distance away almost instantly. So that's what's important. For, as far as the story goes, it's important to know that this is a possibility that you can go from, from point A to point B almost instantly. Um, everything else, would it be nice to know? Maybe, I don't know, maybe as an appendix, maybe as, um, maybe as, a compl as complementary material, but it doesn't really impact the story itself. So if it doesn't impact the story, then it's probably not needed. So this is the same approach that I'm taking with my stories. Um, in the hush, for example, um, there is an environmental disaster that took place that led to extensive drought. Now, you don't need to know the why is behind it, um, because the characters themselves don't particularly care about it. They just know that the drought is messing up with their crops. It's messing up with their ability to have a livelihood. And this is what's important. It's the, the human element. Um, greenhouse gases and nuclear war, or however you want to explain it, that might be interesting, but in the end of the day, what does that mean for the farmer within the story who cannot pay his mortgage, right? So this is, this is, the, this is the human element. And this is, uh, I would like to think that this is why we read stories. We read them for the human element. We don't read them necessarily for the science, for the scientific part. There's, different types of media for that. Like, like Holly said, there's science journals for that. So if something needs heavy exposition, probably it's time to, to take the knife out and start chopping. It's, it's a question of balance. It's a, definitely a question of balance. So the first rule um, in writing this, you know, very heavy exposition is that you should not try to throw everything into the face um, of your reader immediately. So um, I think one of the things uh, that I try to do and uh, that I, you know, I read a lot of the writing advice, I, I read uh, a lot of the books, uh, especially addressing also, you know, uh, creating uh, worlds and um, also um, the, the rules of world building and, you know, advice from famous authors and so on and so on. And basically everyone says that what you should do is try to kind of like um, give small packages of information and, um, you know, kind of make it natural to flow in the dialogue, uh, to um, put you know, your characters in a situation where it would be absolutely natural for them to explore something and not to, you know, press it onto your reader uh, as a sort of, you know, like a uh, something that is just all of a sudden there, for instance, you know, um, 
like two characters talking about the biology of the planet with no apparent reason or no interest of any of the characters, <laughs> you know, about in biology or anything of that sort. So, um, of course, it is difficult to make very, very complex worlds um, without any sort of exposition, but just do it in small bits, you know, like a little bit at the beginning. And then, you know, your character suddenly changes a place and then they see something new. And then you write a little bit to describe this new sort of uh, vision or this new environment. And then you come to a, some sort of natural situation in this environment, for instance, uh, they see, I don't know, a beautiful flower and then all of a sudden this flower is shining, you know, in the moonlight or something like that. So illustrate it, you know, instead of explaining, you know, this, this world has a bioluminescence, you could just say, you know, that this character went out in the moonlight and the flowers were shining in very bright colors. And, you know, sort of like explaining something without really actually throwing it into the face. And then um, what I like to have is I usually, it's a professional deformation. I usually like to have uh, at least one, you know, like a scientist character, at least in my uh, longer stories. And then this scientist character likes to go into, you know, itty gritty and the little bit of details about this stuff, try to figure out how this is working and why this is working. And, you know, for instance, I have this one story where um, my characters are on the Jupiter's moon, Europa, and there, you know, they're growing this huge tank with, uh, uh, with the life that they found. And they're trying to figure out why the little bubbles are going out from the bottom and what these bubbles are doing and so on. Um, so, you know, and I, I didn't start by saying, you know, oh, there's a bioluminescent life there. You know, I started by saying, you know, okay, these characters saw lights in the dark and these lights were moving. So what is that, you know? so just going step by step and introducing this uh, new world a little bit by little bit, it makes it much easier for the reader to absorb all of this information. And I think one other thing which is important is um, kind of like a repetition, but not too much of it. You know, you should uh, try to repeat some crucial, uh, some key concepts that you have when, especially when they're very foreign concepts to your reader, but try to do this repetition, you know, naturally explain a couple of times that something was shining, explain that this is something, you know, unusual, something that they saw for the first time. And uh, it's actually something that also works in biological systems. So there is this thing called redundancy. You know, you always have these fail safes if, if something, um, uh, if something gets broken within your body, usually there are a couple of, you know, um, like security systems that take over this part. So you should build up a system like this in your exposition that you're throwing in a little bits of the information, but always like putting in or repeating a little bit of what you've already said before until this becomes completely natural to your reader. What? Uh, what is your biggest pet peeve about a popular sci-fi? Uh, Patricia? Okay, I've got one. So I think we all have pet peeves and I think what irritates me no end and I know I'm gonna upset somebody with this, but guns in space. Americans running around in space with guns. I just, I don't want to see it. It's like, it's like, this is now the vision of what our future is, is like Americans running around in space with guns. That's my pet peeve. Oh, um, this is probably going to sound like a continuation of the previous question. Um, I really, really don't like it when an author bends over backwards to explain a concept especially when that is explained through um, some kind of exotic material or technology that you can tell is the, the, a feeble attempt to hand wave um, the, the mechanics, right? So, you know, if, if I don't care if the characters don't know how the technology actually works. Just don't give me an obtainium and tell me that this is how the technology works. Um, 
I don't particularly care. Just you know, save it, save it. Um, I'm fine with being told that the characters don't know how it works, or I'm I'm fine with uh, being told that um, it's some kind of uh, some kind of technology that uh, the majority of the characters in there just don't have any idea how it works. I mean, I certainly cannot tell you how um, petrochemicals work, um, or I cannot tell you how a rocket works. Um, there is this great story by Alistair Reynolds, uh, The Aquila Rift, um, and that's a great play on that. Um, it basically involves portals through which spaceships can find themselves uh, very, very distant places in, in the universe. And none of the characters in the story actually knows how it works, and that's, that's a key element of the story, that because you, nobody knows how they work, mistakes do happen, and you end up in all kinds of weird places, finding yourself millions and millions of miles away from home. So I'm fine with that. But, you know, if you're bending over backwards in order to try to explain a concept to me that I don't really need to know, you know, that, that just, that's just the point where I start skimming over and start questioning why I'm investing myself in this story. Um, so I actually did a whole week long series of posts on my Instagram earlier this year that I called my post apocalyptic pet peeves and common things I see in dystopian and post apocalyptic stories that drive me crazy. So I won't get into all of them, but a couple of the big ones that I see a lot um, is unless there's like a nuclear war and all infrastructure is um, destroyed on the planet you're not going to suddenly lose power everywhere and not get it back. Um, I spent a couple of years working at a hydroelectric facility. Um, power generation happens fairly automatically. There's not a lot of human involvement. It's monitoring and maintaining the equipment to generate the power. So in especially with something like nuclear power, you're not going to shut it down because people didn't show up to work. That's not how it works. So power generation is something that can still happen. Your faults come as far as the grid and the distribution of the power. So that will break down over time, but it's not going to necessarily be all of a sudden, you know, everybody dies of a disease and now we don't have power. Um, and especially as we increase renewable energies and solar panels and wind turbines that can do localized powers. And as people get some of this, you know, the solar powers on their house and on a building, that's not gonna necessarily be affected if the grid shuts down. So you may still have pockets of power um, in your post-apocalyptic world. And it drives me crazy when that is never addressed. And it's just, there's no power. We have no idea how to get it back on. So now we're just gonna go live in the woods. Drives me crazy. Um, another big one that's more related to my personal field is as soon as the apocalypse happens, nature rebounds and you have this pristine environment and everything's perfect. And there is so much that humans have done to destroy the environment that at the same time, we need human intervention to correct it. Um, looking at vegetation, especially in the US, um, without human intervention, invasive species are going to take over and, and destroy um, a lot of ecosystems that you're storing. You're not gonna have that pristine wooded area. It's going to be completely filled with invasive undergrowth that is so dense that a mouse can't fit through it. Um, especially where I am, we have Phragmites that choke up all of the waterways and are almost impossible to get rid of with their roots are 30 feet in the ground and you have to burn them in order to really eradicate them. So without that human intervention, they're gonna choke up every wetland that we have. And then there's also the thought that we don't have pollution anymore because humans aren't um, maybe manufacturing, we're not generating it. But that fails to take into account um, chemicals and stuff that are already out in the world and the failures that are going to happen. Um, every gas station you drive by has probably a 30,000 gallon underground tank full of gasoline that at some point is going to leak and that will get into the groundwater that's going to get into the dirt. Um, that's why we have laws and people like me at places where we have to check hazardous waste containers and oil storage containers weekly to mitigate 
these equipment failures and tank failures because eventually things are exposed to the weather and they're going to start deteriorating and breaking down. And as that happens, the pollution in those areas is going to get worse and not better without proper cleanup and mitigation. So some of those things where we have, you know, oh, pristine woods, uh, you know, a month after an apocalyptic event and no power and no um, urge or drive to innovate or turn it back on, that's some of my big pet peeves. Yeah, um, so I think my biggest uh, pet peeve, I'm not sure, you know, I already once did this panel, uh, the scientists writing sci-fi. I'm not sure if I said it then, but one of the, my biggest pet peeves in science is um, the know-it-all characters, the, the you know, uh, jack of all trades and uh, in this in those cases it's usually master of all trades you know so um of course there are people who are really talented for doing uh, many many things uh but you know when you really go into the science uh, even going into one field even even going into like you know subfield of one field of science there is just so much to learn and there is so much to learn every single day you know uh, so many papers to keep on top of so many new findings that uh, you you can't be a jack of all things a master of all things and uh, I think that's the most uh, fictional part of any <laughs> science fiction that you know there is actually someone who can keep up with everything uh, and be up to date with everything unless this is you know very very advanced uh, computer actually in the uh, in behind this character you know some quantum computer that we haven't invented yet uh, and it, this you know character is actually an AI and not a human because, you know, until we have some sort of plugins that we can, you know, easily remember and upload all those th things, I don't think there's a character like that in existence anywhere. How do you uh, balance your real science uh, knowledge when they conflict with well-known tropes in general? Um, Holly? I am not anti-trope as far as stories go. They're tropes for a reason. They work well, people like reading them. What I do try to do is see how I can change them or twist them a little bit to take kind of a unique spin. So um, I'm writing the sequel right now to my eco-terrorism book, which then comes to an apocalyptic um, conclusion. And so I'm taking some of what you see is what I talked about before is my pet peeves and putting those in and playing with some of those tropes on, you know, the wear, weird hairstyles and, you know, non-conventional clothing that people seem to have in the apocalypse. So I think you can take those and twist them and put some of that real life knowledge in there. Um, I did this panel a couple of years ago with MK and she mentioned one of the things she hated was how scientists wear their lab coats outside of the lab when you know your lab coats PPE protective equipment so I made a joke about that in one of my books and just trying to play with those things that maybe people don't think about and test the you know challenge the Hollywood um, interpretation of what a scientist does and things like that so generally I would say that this is an opportunity um, I mean yeah sure tropes are there because because some people see something in them, but at the same time, they also provide, uh, having a certain conflict also provides an opportunity to do something new. Um, never pass on an opportunity to do, do something new, to people, something that people haven't seen before. Um, having said that, um, if, so if, if a well-known trope goes against well-established science, um, it might also provide an opportunity to play on that. Um, and I'm having in mind specifically a lot of a lot of cosmic horror where certain things just go against science and the characters are aware of it. They are aware that what they're looking at should not be. Um, so you can play on that. You can basically have your characters take one look at what's happening and say, this is just not following scientific principles. And that adds a different layer to the whole, to the whole experience. 
Uh, but in general, you know, I'm probably going to sound like a broken record, but in general, it, it, I'm very much of the opinion that if the story is served well, there is a bit of a leeway in, in bending good scientific principles. I'm, I'm not above um, just turning a blind eye into, into what would otherwise be a huge sin from a scientific point of view to, to put on table. That is fine. That is fine. As long as people are having a good time, as long as the story is served, I'm, I'm not about it. Yeah. So um, I'm going to take the question in a slightly different direction, which is to say that I, you know, I do love science. I, I it's why I've, it's why I write science fiction now, and it's why I was in science through most of my life. Was I love it, man? It's so cool. Like the things we've measured in the universe and the way we understand the universe. And one of the downsides of this is that. Uh, I do like to stick science in my stories, but uh, when I think of uh, to the point where the science uh, as I'm drafting, uh, hopefully not in the final version because I get lots of readers, but um, as I'm drafting, it's like, oh, it would be so cool to talk about, I don't know, you know, like the ozone hole or who, who knows what, something tangential to the story, but, but it's something to me that's very gripping and and so where I run into problem with tropes is just that I have kind of more science than some readers want, but it's funny because other readers want, like Evan was saying, some readers actually want more science. So it's hard to find where that, where that balance is. But I put all the science in that I can think of and then I pull out, I pull out whatever seems a little extraneous. Um, in one case, when it, get, when it comes to tropes or con conflict in, in, in what you're doing, I'll give a specific example that, um, you know, so I, I work in a, on a world where the bulk of the society is kind of early 20th century. So they, they, have, they could have trains, except they don't, but they could, they have coal, they have oil, they have carriages and some early automobiles and that kind of stuff. Because of that technology, they should be able to have guns. They can make guns, they should be able to have guns. And when I was in discussions with uh, different people who were building worlds, those people were saying there's no way there is no way your people wouldn't have guns but as i've said i'm not big on guns in space so i was determined to not have guns on my world but to do that scientifically became very hard so i had to find a because i like the science end of things so i had to find a way to scientifically build it so that these people wouldn't have guns and that involved changing their perspective, like changing them genetically and tweaking them so that they're more pacifistic and all this kind of thing. So I, I brought in a little genetic engineering so that they wouldn't develop guns. Uh, I don't know if that directly answers the question, but it sort of gets at how you balance science with sort of expectations people might have when they pick up a book. I think the balance between, you know, science and the tropes is, again the question of your style and uh, you know we're going back to this question of whether you want to go into hard sci-fi and or soft sci-fi and i think for me i don't have i i can't say that i have any sort of like general rule or general way how i do this it's more like the question of my story and the question of my character and you know I might have a different way of approaching this depending on my story and my character so sometimes you know I really want to make some soft sci-fi and I want to focus on some you know like central trope like um, I don't know um alien invasion or something like that you know and then in one story I might have uh, one sort of approach to you know balancing between this trope and the science and in a different story with a different sort of character I will just use a completely different way of balancing out and I might go more towards you know playing with the trope rather than completely sticking to the science whether I choose to go more in a hard sci-fi or, or a soft sci-fi um, so for me, at least, uh, this is a question of, um, you know, what sort of approach and what sort of style I want to write um, this story in and uh, what kind of story and what kind of characters are these going to be. Um, uh, um, according to your, to your uh, 
respective fields, what should someone uh, consider while uh, writing sci-fi around it? Uh, Patricia? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna go, I, I feel like I've been in a bunch of different fields over my life, but um, I'm gonna go with the last one, which was the uh, planetary science, uh, which has led into climate science. And in climate fiction, um, to me, you could you could you can answer this question different ways. It's going to be up to the individual. But for me, one of the things I'm looking at, and this might get back to pet peeves. Um, to me, I feel like one of the things scientifically to think about with climate um, is mass balance. Uh, how much carbon is sunk when we burn it? How much that carbon goes in the air? So we're talking we're talking about you know math. It's simple math. Um, it, it, mass balance globally, budgets, sources, and sinks. You know, it, it's a budgetary uh, problem that we can understand. And, and, and to give you an example of, of, a, of a situation when that would be done poorly, you can imagine uh, a world that is entirely city. We've seen these worlds that the entire planet is now a city, sort of like a Borg cube in planet form. Um, that's just not, I, you know, I can't imagine how that would ever be possible. I, I just don't see it. It's like, where's the oxygen coming from? You know, it, oxy, you, you need oxygenic photosynthesis, as far as I know. You know, we have tanks of oxygen, but those tanks of oxygen we pull out of the air, by and large, if there are other, if, if we have hydrolysis and that kind of stuff to make oxygen, maybe, but I, it just feels like you can't have a planet that's just a city with no plants. It just wouldn't survive. However, if you're going to, if you want that environment, because you, you were writing a story about the Borg, say, or something like that, where the story isn't about climate, but it's about identity or freedom or some other theme, then it's fine. So to, to circle back around and tie a bow on it, according to my respective field, which is climate, I think thinking about planetary budgets probably should happen at some point. Well, I would say keep in mind, well, I have two degrees, right? One of them is in marine biology, the other one's in environmental science with um, specialization in communicating to the public on, on climate change and things like that. So starting from marine biology, I would say keep in mind that the bottom of the ocean works in very, very different ways to, to the rest of the world. Um, actually, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about about the deep ocean. In fact, we know more about, about deep space than we know about the deep ocean. So a lot of things are different. A lot of things um, do, will not work in the same way that we think they will um, in any other ecosystem. So that's something that um, is very important to keep in mind when, um, when, look, when looking into writing about uh, from, from, from this specific point of view. Now, with regards to the environmental science, this is a little bit trickier and I feel it becomes a little bit more political as well because one thing that I found out is that people will not believe anything about climate change unless it's right there in front of their faces. Um, people might ignore climate change until um, the sea takes away their summer house. Um, it will not matter whether or not you talk to them about the plight of the people of Tovalu who are looking into carrying out a mass exodus into another country because their islands are sinking. Doesn't really matter for the majority of the people around the planet. Um, it doesn't matter for the majority of the people that uh, fish are being boiled alive off the coast of Australia because it gets too warm these days. Um, Patricia, you, you come from California, right? I mean, the fires just just keep getting worse and worse every year. And that will lead to bigger and bigger problems. And people in California are starting to understand exactly why climate change is so important. And still we have those voices that say, well, we're getting, we have a winter where we're getting snow. So how can you explain climate change? Well, weather isn't the same as climate change. So one thing to keep in mind is that there will always be a lot of a lot of voices. There will always be a lot of, of voices that are against um, good hard science and good hard facts. Um, I believe a lot of us have um, 
have seen a lot of negative reactions towards vaccines, towards masks, towards um, good practices in, in handling the, the COVID epidemic. So, you know, why, why should climate change be any different? So the, you will never get into the kind of situation where there is a global warning about, about climate change or any other thing, and you would get everybody essentially agreeing, yes, we need to do something about this. And this is something, this is a trope that I very often see in books. There is this global effort in order to get things done. There is a global disaster about to happen. Everybody does the part in order to, to avert it. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Even at the 11th hour, people will be doubting. So that's probably something unfortunate to keep in mind. So I guess uh, we could say that some people don't look up the science behind. The I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. Don't look up. <laughs> Not I wasn't going to reference that movie, but yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, Holly? Um, so I think Patricia and Evan covered the big environmental climate change. So I'm going to bring it in um, smaller to kind of talk about something a little bit different. Um, I think as far as environmental engineering and looking at your world building, um, make sure you're taking into account where your clean water is coming from. Um, how do you get your energy? Um, what happens when you throw something away? Um, a lot of those details can really inform how you put your world together. Because more often, more likely than not, you need water treatment in order to make your water drinkable for humans. Um, there's diseases that can be spread without proper um, wastewater treatment and sewer sanitation and trash and diseases. So you can't just ignore those when you're putting your world together and how do they address things like where do your utilities come from? Is it going to be all green energy? Is it going to be coal powered or burning um, energy recovery where they burn trash to use that to generate power? So kind of think about those small details that make up our world and how do you want to change those and how do you want to work that into your story? There's a lot that can be played with here. Um, I am from, I'm from Michigan. So the Flint water crisis from a couple of years ago where they didn't put anti-corrosives into the water treatment and therefore leached all of the lead out of the piping and got this whole community insanely sick. Um, things like that affect and it's small things and it's long-term things that you don't notice until it's too late. So just kind of have that stuff in the back of your mind as you're world building and trying to create, whether it's a town of, you know, a planet that's all city, and where are you gonna get your water and your oxygen from, or a natural environment and they're out living in the woods and what diseases are they gonna get if they drink from that water and where, you know, where are they gonna go to the bathroom? Nobody wants to talk about going to the bathroom in books. It's not something that, you know, typically moves the story forward. So we ignore it, but, you know, there was a lot of diseases and things like that where we weren't handling waste and material properly. So something you can definitely play with there as your world building that I think is overlooked a lot. So for my specific field, it's um, well, molecular biology, immunology, um, and um, aging. Um, there is this one uh, thing that I've noticed in um, actually many stories, uh, especially the stories that I've read, you know, where like uh, people are going to the foreign worlds uh, and then, you know, astronauts kind of come to this planet and they're popping off their helmets and breathing in the air, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think that's... Uh, uh, one of the things that you need to consider, uh, and it's very, very important, is the evolution of our immune system. You know, uh, everything that is alive on our planet, you know, we've evolved and we've, you know, kind of developed together with this life and we've developed our natural defenses against, you know, all sorts of creatures that 
could somehow harm us, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And, you know, if you go into a foreign planet and the moment you you would, you know, take off your helmet, presuming that the air is, you know, completely breathable and, uh, you know, very, very um, healthy, maybe even healthier than the earth air, you need to consider that if there is anything on this planet, you know, anything foreign, um, think about, you know, all sorts of allergic reactions that you can get just when you're when you're, you know, uh, acquainted with something that you, your body has never felt before. And then there are some people who are reacting, uh, whose immune systems are reacting very, very aggressively towards, you know, uh, some unknown pollutants or, you know, even particles. It doesn't have to be uh, just, you know, like bacterial or viral or any sort of life that activates your immune system. So uh, I, I've, rarely seen I think it was only once that I've seen one story where you know someone takes off their helmet and then their life is completely changed you know they have to live in an isolation unit until the end of their life uh, and this was one story that I read and I was really really impressed that I finally saw it somewhere so uh, this is one thing that uh, comes to my mind and uh, that I would like to see maybe more considered. What are some great uh, examples of science used in sci-fi stories? Um, Hody? Um, well, I mentioned some, I think we all can agree that Martian is a great sci-fi book and the science in there, there's a lot of science in there, but the way that it's handled, um, I think is what's really fascinating because I don't care how he generated water on Mars to grow his potatoes. What I found really interesting about that story is how he talked through the science to keep himself sane and the mental toll that that took and how the science kind of grounded him. So I think that's a really interesting one. Um, another book that I really like, Ready Player One and looking at more, again, it's more the mental and how does the technology affect people and do they use it to benefit themselves? Um, or is it detrimental and where's that balance in that? So those are some, um, Jurassic Park is also great. I mean, all the classics that are out there, I, I enjoy those. I look at a lot, I read a lot of indie sci-fi, which has been really interesting to see some different perspectives and some different things that, does, that don't make it in there and um, AI technology and medical sci-fi is, is really interesting. So there's a lot of really great things out there. You just gotta look for it. Yeah, definitely a lot of great titles out there. So it's a little tricky to pick this one, but um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, Audrey Shulman's Theory of Bastards. Um, the book is about a reproductive biologist who is investigating the, um, the evolutionary drivers behind uh, vulnerable monkeys and their reproductive strategies. Um, but that sounds extremely dry. Um, I promise the story is quite good. Um, what I found really fascinating about it is because you get, you, you see things from the main character's perspective, and I found this an amazing way of representing how a scientist really thinks, which is going through their day and getting small bits and pieces of science informing how they're thinking. So as that main character goes about her day and investigating the monkeys and being relatively dry about the, about the reproductive strategies, she also thinks about her own love life and how her own homo sapiens reproductive strategies have led to a life of pain. Um, personally, when I cook, I find myself, myself nerding out sometimes. I'm thinking about the Maillard reaction while I'm making a stir fry thinking, oh, I'm getting some nice caramelization and I'm um, getting this, you know, the chemical reaction is going to make my food quite good. So, you know, I found this, I found this one of the very few books that had an accurate representation of what it feels like being inside the head of a scientist, which is, I'm still going to go through my day. I'm still going to, I'm still going to worry about my love life. I'm still going to worry about my stir fry turning out all right. But at the same time, I'll be doing this with a slightly more informed manner uh, than, than your layman. I am going to be thinking about everything in a slightly scientific manner because this is, this is who I am and this is how 
this is what my lens is like. This is how I look at the world. So that's Audrey Shulman's Theory of Fast Starts. Wonderful book. Please get it. Uh, okay, so I had some of the same titles. I won't repeat them, but uh, and then some new titles that sound fun to look into. The only title I had that wasn't listed uh, was um, possibly uh, Carl Sagan's Contact. There was some astronomy in Sagan's Contact, especially at the beginning, that I thought was interesting and fairly nicely done. It's like you start to learn about how big arrays of dishes work you know it's kind of cool and uh and how how people listen to noise to find signals from space thought that was really neat uh as i was digging through titles i it struck me that uh a lot of the sort of sciencey science fiction tends to be written by men while more of the social science fiction tends to be writ written by women it's not an absolute but it was something i noticed as i was looking at titles. And I think Le Guin and Atwood and Butler, they all wrote awesome science fiction, but it tended to be a little more socially oriented. Uh, and when it comes to Le Guin, she said something. I don't know. I, it was It's just a cute little quote. It sort of applies to the idea of science in science fiction and this idea as to whether, you know, should it be real? Should it are we free to play? She liked to say that we that we tell lies in fiction uh, in order to uncover truth. And uh, she said, children know perfectly well that unicorns aren't real, but they also know that books about unicorns, if they are good books, are true books. So I, 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 th I think about that when I think about, is it okay to take science and sort of turn it on its head a little bit? Well, if I think about my field specifically, so one sci-fi story, actually two sci-fi stories, uh, that I read um, very, very recently. Um, so one of them was um, Hail Mary, uh, Andy Weir. And there I, uh, I actually, you know, there were a couple of elements in this story developed from something very familiar to something, you know, that was very, very foreign, but I'm not going to spoil it for everyone who wants to read it. Uh, but there was this one element, you know, when they need to build uh, like a huge uh, facility for collecting energy, and they're actually covering the entire Sahara Desert uh, with um, solar panels. And what it was, uh, you know, very, very interesting for me specifically in that story is that it was the first time that someone has mentioned, you know, but now we've covered the entire Sahara desert with like solar panels. And now we're going to have a huge environmental effect because we've done it. And, and uh, I think this is an awesome example of, you know, using kind of this, uh, our knowledge about the uh, environmental changes and you know that the little i mean seemingly kind of little on a planetary scale interventions could have on the global environment uh, so um i'd actually recommend that uh, to anyone it's it's playing with a couple of uh, ideas about the environmental effects there are also some really uh other really cool things uh, when it comes to biology and stuff like that. But as I said, I don't want to spoil that book for everyone. And uh, so, uh, yeah, another example that is really, really good is Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And, and I, I think there they played with, you know, some known scientific facts and some known, uh, you know, elements, and then they kind of blew it up, of course, because it's a science fiction, right? Uh, but um, there they, uh, in this story, they tried to recreate a human evolution uh, by, you know, um, kind of introducing these viral vectors uh, into an ape species. But instead of introducing it into an ape species, they introduce it into uh, spiders. And uh, there are some really interesting facts there, you know, about uh, the similarity between, you know, like um, our uh, evolution and, you know, what spiders did, but also how insects are functioning and how they have their own societies and, you know, how they're guided by a little, little 
different things. And then, you know, when finally humans and spiders met, what kind of interactions are uh, happening there? So that's a really, really interesting, mind-boggling story. Um, not perfect for the ones who are suffering from arachnophobia. So if you're suffering from arachnophobia, then keep away from it. Uh, but uh, for all of the ones who can live with giant spiders, <laughs> or at least imagine living with them, uh, then I'd really recommend it. I think it, it it starts with some very interesting, you know, scientific ideas and scientific principles, and then it blows them into something uh, very imaginary and uh, very interesting. Quick note, personally, uh, uh, I like the manga anime Dr. Stone. I just recommend people, it's like, uh, it's like a scientist who tries to, uh, to reduce uh, civilization by, by using uh, science. Uh, what uh, resources, uh, resources you would uh, recommend to sci-fi uh, writers? Evan? Bit of an interesting question. Um, because in the end of the day, sci-fi writing is writing, right? So, you know, the old maxim of read, read, read widely and read um, usually works um, and just read everything. Read essays, um, these particularly have helped me. Um, especially creative essays, uh, read scientific journals, read popular science magazines. Um, the Smithsonian Institute has a wonderful website, wonderful articles, um, very interesting and written in a very comprehensible manner. Um, read historical fiction or read magic realism or read romance, just read and let the connections form in your head um, once you sit down and start writing science fiction, because this is where this is where true creativity starts popping up, right? Creativity is making connections where there are seemingly no connections to be made. So do keep in mind that you're gonna be writing everything through a science fiction lens, but the more, the more material you have behind it, the more interesting your science fiction will become. Um, reading is to writing what breathing in is to breathing out. So, and taking as many influences outside of science fiction as possible, which just make your own science fiction so much more interesting. You wanna do um, a detective story in science fiction? That has been done and that has been done very successfully. So, so and why not use some other genre? Why not use, I don't know, pirates in science fiction? Why not use um, doctors in science fiction or cowboys in science fiction or whatever? And just have fun, have fun, read widely. Read a lot, read what you like, read things that maybe you might not like, or might still provide some ideas, but read widely. Okay, so um, I would say I, I have a few resources that I turn to again and again. Um, everyone knows about, about Google, but not everyone knows that Google has a sub Google called Google Scholar. And if you go to Google Scholar, you can find the primary research. So you might be interested on whether there's a parasite that eats a brain and gives someone a personality disorder. Who knows what you're interested in? You can go on Google Scholar and see if that exists in the research anywhere. Um, the popular science that Evan mentioned, absolutely, Scientific American, Science Daily, those are good, uh, easy to read, digestible ways to let that science get into you and excite you about things we're thinking about with dark matter or who knows what. Um, I would also say there are plenty of scientists on writing forums, and we scientists are happy to bounce ideas around. So if there are any writers on this listening to this panel, uh, join a writer's forum, especially one that has a sci-fi sub-forum, and you'll probably find people with backgrounds in physics, math, all of it. Um, and, you know, when I was struggling with orbital dynamics and, and launch windows, I just asked on my writer's forum and like three different people piped up explaining some of the stuff that I didn't understand. Um, and then the last thing I would say uh, is you can find courses on YouTube. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about electricity generation for my last novel. And I found a great course from MIT. This you know, professor at MIT recorded his entire course on electricity. It was like 12 YouTube videos. So I got to sit in on this MIT course in the comfort of my home and uh, learn about you know, whatever, cathodes, anodes, the whole thing. 
um, which I probably had learned before, but it was good to it was good to have all that again. Um, and then for inspiration, I like documentaries on Netflix. It just inspires me. So those are my suggestions. Uh, well, I'm basically just going to echo what the others said. Um, reach out to people is how I've gotten a lot of um, my research, um, finding critique partners that have backgrounds in some of the sciences or other areas that I'm working in can be extremely helpful. Um, for my eco-terrorism novel, there's a lot of police procedure and some you know, EMT stuff. And I didn't know that my critique partner was an EMT. And oh my gosh, did it completely change how I wrote those scenes. So um, a lot of times the other writers that you know, um, the writers that you're gonna meet here at Write Hive and in these panels and in these conferences, are amazing resources. And at least every writer that I've met is more than willing to help and to wants to help make your story better with you. Um, and then especially those of us who are scientists, and there's a lot of us, even within Right Hive, um, we're passionate about our work and our science, and we're happy to talk about it, and we're happy to share our thoughts and to help you build that and make it more realistic. So don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to think that you're bothering someone or we're gonna think you're stupid. We all have to learn um, and we're happy to help for the most part. Everyone I've run across has always been amazing and happy to help. Um, for some more regulatory environmental stuff, um, you can always get your laws and regulations. Those are all out there. Um, in the US, a lot of states have some really nice reports on what their top invasive species are and management plans for things like that on government websites and things like that. But I think one of your greatest resources is gonna be your fellow writers. Um, so of the resources uh, that you should have, well, one of them, uh, one of them should be some sort of, um, maybe some sort of contact, uh, at least, you know, if you're not an expert, then at least some sort of contact uh, with people who are experts in the field in which you're writing, if you want to stick to a kind of like this, as I said before, harder sort of sci-fi. And um, so for instance, for me, uh, I have my expertise in molecular biology, but I have a brother who is in engineering. So I'm, for instance, when I'm writing something that requires some advanced engineering, I'm always contacting him and, you know, writing WhatsApp messages and asking him, hey, you know, is this too crazy? You know, is this something that one could imagine in the future or am I completely off? Uh, and, you know, for instance, my sister, she's an architect. So I'm also always messaging her, you know, I imagine this huge, like a building that has a waterfall in between, you know, is this something that, you know, you could imagine happening sometimes in the future or would like, like, you know, what kind of materials would this building need to be made from? And, you know, what would be the problems here? And, um, you know, having contacts like that, uh, and even if you're, you know, just reaching out on, uh, you now there are all kinds of social prep platforms, and there are all kinds of people who are really, you know, like into science and they want to explain it and they want to interact and they want to explain and tell you about it. Uh, just finding those peoples, finding those communities and, uh, you know, getting in touch with the right people to help you do this the right way. I think this is the most important uh, resource to have. Um, I'm not sure if you can call it a resource, but let's call it a resource, you know, some sort of uh, network. Uh, anything to multiply, starting with uh, Holly? Sure. Um, so I said, like I said, I have five books currently out, four in a series called The Journey Missions, which is military sci-fi. It takes place underwater. So we have submarines and underwater colonies. And then an eco-terrorism novel called Cleansing Rain. Um, you can follow me um, on Facebook and Twitter is, or Facebook and Instagram is where I spend most of my time. And I am at Holly Ash writer on those two platforms. And I am Holly Ash 85 on Twitter. So always feel free to reach out and connect. 
Thank you. Uh, but, uh, Patricia? Okay, great. Well, um, the, first of all, thank you. These questions have been a lot of fun to talk through. And in terms of plugging something, everybody has seen uh, the stuff over my shoulder. So that's 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 that. Um, on social media, I'm at PL Tavermina all over the place. You can just like find me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. But what I really want to plug is not my stuff, but this contest that I just heard about. So if any of you writers out there listening have a climate themed uh, story, uh, preferably novel or screenplay, uh, there's a contest you can enter. It's open this month. Uh, it's filmfreeway.com, writing climate pitch fest. And if you can't find it at filmfreeway.com slash writing climate pitch fest, you can uh, hit me up on Twitter at PL Tavermina and I will give you the link directly. That's what I want to plug. More climate stories. Thank you. Um, Evan? So my debut novel is coming out in July this year uh, by Inspired Quill. It's a speculative fiction novel. Um, it's about two people who haven't spoken to each other in years and years and years, um, husband and wife, um, and the damage that this has done to their relationship. And it takes place in an environment where uh, climate has changed. Climate has changed, drought, um, just making things all the more difficult. So keep your eyes open on that. Um, I have short stories being, haven't been published in Clark's World, uh, on spec coming up soon. And um, please buy more books. We need more readers. <laughs> MK? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I have Instagram and I have Twitter account. So my Instagram is m.k.martins. And my Twitter is at M, uh, the little dash underneath. I don't know what it's called, underscore or whatever. Uh, so again, M dash, dash underneath, K dash underneath Martins. Uh, and you can follow me there. And uh, I am, as I said, I'm publishing some of my uh, microfiction on uh, these accounts. I'm also a member of uh, multiple writing groups. So if you're on this card with um, me in some sort of group or anything, feel free to contact me. And um, as I said, I also have a short story collection that I'd like to publish this year. So just uh, follow my accounts and keep up to date. And uh, I'll tell you if there is anything new. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to our panelists. And thank you to all your, uh, uh, your uh, Thank you to all uh, the viewers. Uh, if you like the panel, uh, the, panel uh, the panelists will be in, uh, in the chat to answer uh, any question. Uh, uh, another uh, happy convention and have a great day and have a good life.